Welcome back, everybody, to the Con Expo Con A podcast. I'm your host, as always, Taylor White, and I first want to start by thanking everybody and the listeners for the five-star reviews on the platforms where our podcast is streamed today. We have an amazing guest um, that I feel privileged to have here, um, and I know that a lot of listeners are going to be really excited to hear from. Um, a construction icon that has literally, quite literally, taken over the industry, Mr. Jeff Cavanaugh. Jeff, I'm super to have you, happy to have you on today. Thank you. Listen, it, it's such an, an honor to, to have you sit down here. I know we were saying before we kind of came on that you've, you've never done something like this before. And uh, I know that it, it means a lot for you to cut out time, especially to, to even do this. And I think that people are going to hear a lot of value that, that you're going to bring in, in having conversations, answering questions about the industry and people just hearing your opinion. So thank you. Yeah, so Jeff, first of all, I want to start off by uh, asking and, and getting your input on a lot of construction stuff, but I know that maybe some of the listeners that are listening today um, might not know who you are and what you're about. So, you know, if, if you kind of had to describe what you're doing, what you have kind of going on, um, how, how would you, you do that? Well, we have a large construction firm here in the Ottawa Valley of Nation's Capital, and we have um, over 1,200 employees working for us. We do all things construction. Uh, we do home building. We're into land development. We build houses. We backfill houses, dig basements. We have aggregates, pits and quarries, asphalt plant, concrete plant, all types of heavy equipment. Yeah, no, I mean, you guys definitely do a bunch of everything. Um, so, so within all that, you just listed off a bunch of different things. And that is, to me, you know, even doing it at the size that we're at, I often wonder, like, how does somebody like you manage to do that? It's so, like, what is your role within all this? Well, I would say that I used to be a micromanager, but uh, maybe I still am a little bit. But, you know, I've we've hired a lot of people to work for us that take care of their sector of the business. And they uh, wake up every morning and, you know, rather than being reactive to that, a sector of the business they're proactive and that's made a big difference yeah no, i agree so hiring the right people hiring good people is super important definitely yeah um as you kind of went from you know where kavanaugh started um maybe give a bit of background on that like where did kavanaugh start and kind of where is it now well about 70 years ago my dad purchased a dump truck and you know, went into business for himself. Uh, my mom obviously was very instrumental in uh, collecting the bills and getting the bills out. And they were a great team working together. I would say that uh, they got a real break in business. One time they went to the Seaway and they were working for, I think it was, I might get the numbers wrong, but I think they were working for $3.50 an hour here in Ottawa for a dump truck. And they went to build part of the Seaway and they were getting eight dollars an hour to for a dump truck at uh, up in Cornwall where they're building the seaway so my father and his brother were up there with their two dump trucks and you know the boss came up to them one day and said do you have any more drivers like you back in ottawa tommy we'd use some more so my dad uh got 10 drivers from ottawa and paid them seven dollars an hour and you know made a dollar an hour on the the difference and that was, I think my mom said that was probably the only money they ever made trucking on the seaway was that extra dollar they made from the higher trucks. So, I mean, that's where it started, you know, and they came back here and they've had lots of lucky breaks, you know, we bought, uh, there was, it used to be a company called H, uh, uh, what was it called? And McCoy, they used to work in Ottawa and back in the day. And when McCoy kind of left the, left the business, kind of left a hole for, for my parents to, uh, you know, start selling gravel in a township called Goulburn Township, which is now part of the city of Ottawa. And, you know, just a lot of hard work for my parents, you know, just six phones at the kitchen table. And that was before you could have phones with different lines on them. And, you know, if the phone rang, we were, uh, we were taking an order right there on the spot. So, I mean, it went from, from just, you know, selling gravel and building roads to in 1990, we uh, started into the land development little bit and not a i guess we learned the hard way how not to develop land first so that was a pretty good lesson for us and we learned how not to buy land we learned how not to sell land so we got a 
So we got a real clinic on uh, how not to do things first. And uh, we've learned our lessons from there. And uh, you know, now we have over uh, 50 subdivisions on the go right now inside the, you know, outside the Ottawa Valley and uh, selling, you know, lots of lots. We originally uh, we would develop the land and sell the lots to the builders. Now we're kind of taking a different approach where we'll be uh, developing the lots and uh, uh, selling them internally to uh, our housing company. So, you know, in 1990, we started into the sewer and water business as well. So, um, you know, we started with uh, one crew, two crews. I think we have uh, seven or eight crews right now putting sewer and water on the ground. And it's, uh, you know, in I'm not sure the exact year, but oh, it was about uh, 14 years ago or so, we started the asphalt business. And, uh, you know, we bought an asphalt plant and a crew and, we originally thought, no, I originally thought that it would be hard to uh, lay the asphalt and it would be relatively easy to make it. That was exactly backwards. We had a great crew that could lay it, no problem, but we had troubles making it. The first stuff was right on spec, but it just wouldn't come off the spade shovel. So it was really sticky. So we, need, we had to learn a lot about uh, how to make asphalt. And we've had some great, great uh, help over the years. Uh, Fern Pizzuto and like lots of the guys that worked for us were just totally invested in the company and they uh, they worked their their hearts out to make it work. And, you know, we started into the concrete business probably about, about 15 years or so ago. We had a couple of trucks and we, a uh, couple of concrete trucks we worked for delivering concrete for Lafarge. And then we started to... Uh, you know, get more trucks and more trucks until we had 16 trucks uh, hauling concrete for Lafarge. Anyways, and we were selling concrete on the side. Anyways, that uh, relationship soured over the years and they uh, they didn't want us to sell their concrete anymore. So we ended up making a deal with a local firm in uh, Smith Falls, uh, the McNamee's, McNamee Concrete. And we uh, made a purchase and sale agreement with them that's uh, worked out very well. And... You know, we've, uh, that business has uh, just been booming for us. The, the concrete is really uh, doing well. And, you know, the McNamee's worked very hard and they were, they stayed on for about two and a half years after the purchase to make sure it went very well. And then we hired another guy named Al Brown that came to work for us and he's uh, just taken it to a whole new level. And, you know, it's now it's a big part of our business. You know, it's we're a very vertically integrated business where we sell. You know, we start off with the pits and quarries and then, you know, we develop the land. We clear cut the land. Then we have a land development team that puts it through the ringer, I say, to get it approved. And then, you know, we have different crews to come in, do all aspects of it. So after we get it approved, then we put the uh, we clear the trees. Then, you know, we blast the site, you know, you know we would say uh, prepare the site for the sewer crews who show up, sewer crews show up with the pipe in the ground. Then, you know, we have the road crews come in, put the roads in after that, asphalt crews come in, put the asphalt on top. Then it doesn't stop there. We turn around and we have another sector of our business, residential side that uh, digs the basements, backfills the houses. Then the concrete crews come in, forming crews come in, put the forms in the ground. After that, you know, we have a landscape division that puts the topsoil on. And then on top of that, we have, uh, you know, Reno's uh, division inside of the asphalt sector that puts the, you know, the paved laneways. So it's a, it's a totally vertically, vertically integrated top to bottom. That was one of the things actually that um, I had written down here that I find super interesting and with everything that you're saying like that. Yeah, I, I mean, coming from where, where you are to, to now is amazing. And like you explained it and however, you know, long that was. But I feel like it's like it's so much more than that as well, too. You know, I feel like there's so much to even comment on about your growth and what you guys are like. You, I mean, there's not one person that you couldn't go up to in, in Ottawa and be like, oh, like, you know, you know, Kavanaugh construction. And it's like, yep, yep. Like everybody, you know, um, but you touched on vertical integration, which was something that I wanted to, to chat with you about. Um, because I, I, you know, I see like a lot of success from people I find comes from, um, 
okay, like we use a lot of rock, we need to buy a quarry. We use a lot of sand, we need, we need sand. We use concrete, we need concrete plant. We use asphalt, we need asphalt. What's the thought process with you going into that? Like, like what goes through your, like, is it a dollar figure amount of like, where like, okay, we've done this much. It makes sense for us to vertically integrate and buy a concrete company or make, start our own. Like, it, what's the thought process behind doing that? You know, even like it, little things, you know, that you hear like styrofoam, like you guys have a styrofoam, like, don't you, don't you, you have a styrofoam business as well too, that like you make your own or something like that? Well, uh, we're a distributor for Ontario. We uh, purchased it out of Quebec and we are a distributor for Stara Rail in Ottawa. It's like stuff like that. Like uh, you have an amazing team, but how do you, what's the thought process behind making these decisions to be like, okay, pull the trigger. We need quarry. Okay. Pull the trigger. We need concrete. Well, my parents started in the pits and quarry business, you know, when I was very, very young, obviously I had nothing to do with it back then. And, uh, you know, the opportunities in front of us, we just, uh, you know, it just kind of snowballed into where it is today. Um, you know, we got into the asphalt business because we landed a job that had 180,000 tons of asphalt on it. And we had over a hundred thousand tons of asphalt on the books to do next year. So it just made sense that, uh, you know, if we we're going to go into the asphalt business now was the time. And as far as the concrete business is concerned, I've, I've always loved the concrete business. We make the cement powder here in Ontario. We have the water here in Ontario. We have the sand and stone in, in here in Ontario. So it's a great local business that uh, you can make the product right here. You don't have to go overseas to get the the oil or the anything like that. And, you know, on a 50 year life cycle, concrete is a better value than asphalt. However, no politicians get elected in four-year life cycles, so we don't have concrete roads. We have asphalt roads, and you know, asphalt is you know better in certain circumstances. It's more flexible, so and you know. But anyway, I like both products, and I just uh, just believe in all things construction. We're we're developing, you know, the lots of the city of Ottawa, and uh, we're proud of what we do, and we try and do it right. Yeah, it's amazing listening to you two talk because of, if you're humble about it, but it's it is pretty incredible. You guys are the whole package deal. Um, like you said, there's a set of vision, a customer wants it, or you guys are doing it yourselves, and it's like boom, this is a 40 acre bush, and we're going to put roads and houses, and it's going to be a community for families to flourish in, um, which is un un pretty crazy. But the like making the decision to like you said like you know kind of with the asphalt like we had this on the books and that on the books um for maybe some people listening um that kind of decision obviously happens when you're at a certain size so how does the smaller guy that's because we have a lot of like a lot of people listening majority of people listening um you know their companies are small to medium as well right at what point do you think it's feasible for somebody obviously having that on the books helps and having the jobs and, and everything like that. Um, but at what point do you think they should make decisions to be like, okay, like maybe it's time we do buy a pit or a quarry, or maybe we do, you know, start doing our own asphalt and, and kind of do that. Even a business that, that is, you know, subbing out a bunch of asphalt right now um, to do another company and puts a couple points on it. At what point should they, look at themselves and be like, okay, maybe we should buy a paver and start doing paving. Maybe not even going as far as buying, buying an asphalt plant and doing this, but at what point is it like, okay, we should get the right people to do this and build the right team and do our own. There's no answer for that. You know, it's all, it comes from within inside you. If you think it's a good time, I guess it is, but I wouldn't go risking everything, you know, to, to buy something that, you know, because on a whim, it's gotta be, you know, there's no answer for that question. <laughs> so I can't answer it. It's, yeah. it's hypothetical. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> if you feel like you can make it work, you probably make it work. Um, but so w with that kind of response, you just eat, sleep, breathe construction, right? Like that, that would be fair to say, like it, it's in, it's in your DNA. It's in your blood. Is that more fair? Well, you, I could, you know, maybe, I guess, I mean, I, we do all things construction when, uh, when I was growing up, uh, my babysitter was a dump truck driver, you know, uh, so 
it uh, makes it easy that way, I guess. We, uh, you know, I would, I, I like construction. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and I, you know, if we get talking when we're drinking on a Friday night, my cousin and I, you know, it'll, it ends up inevitably going back to, you know, rock talk or whatever you want to talk about, you know, or the equipment or the, what's the right equipment for the job or what's the, what's the right truck configuration. So I guess we do live, breathe and speak it. On the other hand, though, we, we have, we have other things that we enjoy as well, you know, like we have some outside activities like boating and race car driving or whatever it may be. You know? Yeah. I think it's important to definitely have, um, other things outside of construction as well, like, you know, hobbies and stuff, even in, in business, I'm sure there's other business stuff that you're doing outside of construction, you know, that of it just interests you. Right. Um, but, um, you have all these things like, how does Jeff Kavanaugh, how do you do what you do? Like, what are you doing to manage stress? Like, again, like the, you got to remember, like the listeners listening to this, this is, you know, it's like somebody, when they talk to somebody who owns like, you know, runs like 17 different businesses, it's like, they want to know, like, how, what are you doing? Obviously having the right people, but what are you doing to manage the stress, manage your day, have an agenda? Like what's the, your, your, what's your regime for that? Well, you got to let it roll off your back. It's, you're not going to, it's not going to all go good all the time. You got to take it in perspective. You know, there's lots of times where you can go onto a job site and, you know, you see the guys aren't doing something right or they're on break and, you know, there's not, not go up to them and, you know, with an iron fist and basically tell them you should be working harder right now. And what, you know, if you'd have been here five minutes ago, you would have probably caught them working, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, you know, and lots of times it's, you know, you see things going wrong and, you know, but lots of times you see things going right. So like we, there's more right than wrong and at Kavanaugh Construction. And I would, uh, I'm, I'm proud of the way all the boys work, you know, there's, and boys and girls, sorry, obviously. And there's no, uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that exact question, but I would say let it roll off your back is a good one because lots of the times, you know, what I say is, you know, put it in perspective and, and, uh, I say to myself, I never did mind about the little things, you know, so, you know, you try to, uh, but and on the other hand, then sometimes I really drill down on little things. So I don't, I guess it's not the hypothetical question again. So it, it, each situation is a little bit different. Um, so I don't know, a few, uh, a few years or about, about six months ago, maybe we started, uh, you know, we tried to write down on paper what our vision is and what our mission is. So you can come back to, you can come back to that a little bit if you're trying to make a decision. So, uh, we, uh, our, uh, vision is, uh, building vibrant communities. So there's a lot to unpack in that in that little, that little saying, you know, building, yes, Kavanaugh construction and Kavanaugh group of companies is always building and we're building houses, building subdivisions, you know, but, and vibrant, you know, when you look at a community, uh, inside of Kavanaugh construction, it's very vibrant. It's, you know, it's, it's life itself. And if you, you know, go to your local grocery store, just maybe somebody that's working for Kavanaugh construction, that's maybe buying their groceries there or buying their garden hose at home depot so it's a lot of uh community driven and then you know building vibrant communities so there's more than just actually building the subdivision itself it's a community inside of Kavanaugh construction and it's a community you know that they live and breathe and work at you know and the also the communities where if you go to a community center you might see a Thomas Kavanaugh construction sponsored hockey team or Zamboni or, you know, certain aspects of a hospital that we're donating to. So that's building vibrant communities. It's more than just the community itself that we're building. It's community inside of Kavanaugh construction. And, you know, the, can't think of the word right now, the, the people that deal with Kavanaugh construction, the outside uh, businesses that deal with Kavanaugh construction as well. I actually had in here, you touched on it, the community. You do a lot for the community um, and we see your stuff everywhere. Growing up, I played at the Kavanaugh Senseplex. You know what I mean? Um, 
in almost at every fair and charity auction or charity event, you see something from Kavanaugh. Um, you know, why do that? And what do you love most about doing that? You know, Kavanaugh Construction makes its money in this local community and we try to give back to the local community. We're not, uh, we don't sponsor things in Toronto. Not that we wouldn't, but you know, that's not, and we don't sponsor, you know, things in, you know, somewhere in Europe or something like that. You know, we try to sponsor things right here at home. That's where, where our interest is. So, you know, there's, there's sick people and there is poor people and starving people right here in the Ottawa Valley. We don't need to go too far to help somebody. So there's lots of help can be done right here. And that's where we try to support where, where we've uh, got our support from. Yeah. It's, it's, it's everywhere. You're kind of putting the money back into the community and it's definitely apparent because I mean, like the car fairs this weekend and I'm on the antiques fair board there and we do a sponsor as well, but like the whole stage that we even, we do our auction on, it's like you guys donate it every single year, like the, their mobile stage. And it's just like, and you guys do it way more up for the car fair as well too. But, um, it's just really cool to see a company that I, I would say that there's not another company in Ottawa that does give back as much as you guys, as far as charity and sponsoring back to the community as well. Um, it's, it's kind of just, just everywhere, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, I want to talk about, um, if someone was in a small or, or medium sized company, what advice would you give somebody, um, in today's world and the way that the economy is now with inflation and fuel prices and job shortages and labor shortages or labor shortages, not job shortages. There seems to be lots of work, but what advice would you give that, that guy or girl? Well, uh, you know, at first you gotta be a micromanager because it's all on you. And, and as you get your business to be, you know, more, more scalable or sized up, you can't micromanage everybody. And so what I found is that, uh, just looking in the mirror, I found that I was becoming a too much of a micromanager for the size of our business. And we were able to, uh, you know, empower the people that work for us and in particularly the bosses in that sector. So just, you know, holding people accountable to their job. Yes. But the, you know, hiring good people is obviously, you know, a very good answer. Hire somebody smarter than you. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good way to go. And I haven't been able to do that. We've got lots of excellent employees working for Thomas Cavanaugh Extraction. And, you know, like I said earlier, they, they get up every morning and live and breathe that sector of the business. You know, whereas, you know, we have somebody in charge of aggregates. We have somebody in charge of concrete, somebody in charge of asphalt somebody in charge of the shop, you know, Mike Kavanaugh is in charge of the shop. Yes. But he also has somebody that's in charge of the truck side. Somebody that's in charge of the heavy equipment side. Somebody's in charge of the paint and body shop. Somebody that's in charge of the weld shop, you know, so, you know, each person, you know, looks after their section and wakes up living and breathing that section of the business so that they're proactive as to what we need, not being reactive, you know, so that's, you know, getting people, holding people accountable to their job and hiring the right people would be my advice. If you need to meet them, they're here at the Con Expo Con Ag. You'll meet industry leaders and friends. You'll build new relationships in the community. You'll find the equipment, services, and people within the construction field. Registration is now open. Save 20% off show admission with the promo code PODCAST20. Again, that is promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% off your registration. I'm going, Jeff Cavanaugh will be going, tons of people will be going. It is North America's largest construction trade show and it is March 14th to the 18th, 2023 in the beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out conexpoconag.com to register and for more info, back to the podcast. You said something really important. Um, you said when those people wake up, those men and women wake up, you said that they eat, sleep and breathe that job. I would argue that you guys have an amazing culture at Kavanaugh, the green army, you know, like the, it, how do you create that culture? Because that's what I create with social media and, and what we do. 
what how do you create that you guys have such a strong and and you know a week back you guys had an event for families to come i think it was last weekend or the weekend before right and it was like i even had some guys that uh, uh, left me this year to go work for Kavanaugh. And, you know, they were posting pictures of it. It made me feel like, you know, damn, like I need to be doing this as well. Like he's incorporating the families because that all builds culture as well and bringing in your families because that's why we do what we do. But how do you, how have you been creating that culture? How, how come you, how do you think those people wake up every day and want to eat, sleep and breathe Kavanaugh? Because I think that that is true and fair to say. Well, like guys, like we just empower them to, to do their own job. We don't, you know, you have, you trust people as much as you can and you you know you give them the tools to do what they want and get out of their way you know it's and empowering that foreman to look after his crew of guys and pouring empowering that superintendent to look after the 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 foreman's and that that's under his uh realm or whatever the word might be we run a business where we try and trust everybody first and if and it, it pays dividends if in the end, I think. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, it, I think it, it goes even more beyond that with you guys as well, um, as far as the culture. Um, because because that's a real, it's a really important conversation in construction right now, is creating culture around your business. Because now we live in, you know, in a world where every other construction company needs people to work for them because of labor shortages, right? And every other company is trying to offer more and more. So like you guys offer obviously what you offer, but I think it even goes beyond that into your branding and the branding and the culture kind of overlap with each other with like the green, like, the, you know, the green trucks, the, the green everything, uh, the shiny chrome dual stack, you know, dump trucks. Like where did that all start? And like, I guess, cause you're aware of it, but like at what point were you aware? Like, yeah, yeah, like that's what we are. We're the, the long nosed Peterbilt tractors with the stacks and like the chrome live bottoms. That's us. When, when was it like that? Is it? Uh, I don't know the exact year, but I was somewhere, somewhere in the mid to late nineties. Uh, my cousin, Mike Cowan and I were in the shop one day and you know, we were, we were rebuilding old trucks and fixing old trucks. And it was, I think it was, it's Mike's mostly in charge of that branding of how it makes the stuff look so nice on the road. But we just decided at that point in time that if we were going to buy something, it was going to be best in class. You know, so we thought Kenworth's were the best dump trucks at the time. So we started buying Kenworth dump trucks. And we thought if Caterpillar shovels were, we thought were the best shovels, we would buy Caterpillar shovels. If we thought Volvo rock trucks were the best rock trucks at the time, we would buy Volvo rock trucks. So we tried to buy what was best in class because we were using the product and basically wearing it out, fixing it and wearing it out and then selling it. So it was like, like we didn't want to work on junk anymore. So we tried to, we tried to buy dump trucks and maybe not even the exact brand, but buy the truck with a little bit beefier engine or a, beefier suspension or you know the the shovels with a better undercarriage on them not just the cheapest product but what we figured was best in class and that's when we started i don't know somewhere about 97 i guess or maybe i don't know the exact year but it was before 2000 we bought the best in class for the maintenance we bought the best in class for our team so they would have the best tools to use to get the productivity we were looking for yeah, I think that that's a super important to touch on um, because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not the one that's going to be sitting in the excavator for 50 hours a week. You know, it's going to be the guy out there. I want to make sure what they're running is running. And that's what you're saying is you know, like, let's make sure our employees actually enjoy what they're sitting in all week because we want to make sure that they're happy because if they're not, then you're not going to get the work out of them. You're not going to get the production. And then it's just a whole domino effect. So that is a, a good point to touch on. Um, yeah, the, the branding is really cool. And if people are listening right now and you don't know, um, Kavanaugh, cause you're listening from wherever in the world, um, their trucks are very trucks and machinery is very dominant. Like this is us, this is Kavanaugh. And I think that that's something really important that even relates, like even with us, with our black excavators, actually people listening, Kavanaugh is the one that paints our shovels black. 
um, in your in your body shop, which is super cool. Um, so that's kind of like our thing, you know, like we we do black and now there's other people recreating it, but we were the first. <laughs> um, issues in, t in today's world, this is an, uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk about with you today. Um, as far as labor shortages, inflation and fuel prices, how are you combating those things with what you're doing? Because estimating and pricing jobs, carryovers from last year, how is that affecting your you guys at Capital? Well, it hurts. Obviously, we got caught flat footed when the price of fuel went up. That was a uh, that was a, a real blow to the to the bottom line just because of the price of fuel. Nobody expected fuel to go from I think at one point, you no, know, like eighty cents a liter to two fifty a liter for diesel. It was was crazy in the span of a uh, you know twelve to fifteen month period. So obviously we got caught flat footed as excuse me, most people did. And uh, but we've rectified that now, particularly with the the, the trucking. You know, we were uh, I think triaxle dump truck rates went from ninety two dollars an hour in January to ninety five dollars an hour to one hundred and five dollars an hour to one hundred and five dollars an hour with a fuel surcharge. So it's uh, maybe it's still not enough. I don't know what the right price is for uh, a triaxle dump truck, but it's with the fuel surcharge on there now i think that is the uh that's a that's a good way to combat the rise in, and fall of fuel i think that's the that's the way to go and i believe it was the right uh the way the right answer for that that problem you mentioned two other things there i can't remember what they were besides fuel yeah whenever i said fuel your brain just went oh shit fuel <laughs> <laughs> um like finding people to work and, 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 and well, inflation, I guess, ties into the, the fuel. So like finding people to work, I, you know, obviously I would assume that you would have a recruiter or, you know, people out there are looking for people or, you know, a strategic plan as to like, how are we going to get people when it's incredibly hard to fill the seats of trucks or, you know, the trenches doing water mains, the guys like every position. Uh, we hired a full-time recruiter last year that in-house, and we're always looking for uh new employees and we are short right now on the uh on the dump truck end of things it's just because we've just had so many new dump trucks just come in just recently you know we ordered them a long time ago but they're just coming in now and it's probably not really a good time of year to hire drivers it's uh mid-september so it's it's not like april the spring of the year so it, it is a tougher time but you know we do offer uh you know, full benefits, full benefits, full pension. And uh, we have employee profit sharing and they don't start right away. We kind of, uh, the way it works at Kavanaugh is, you know, you start off with your wage the first year. And then after you've been here one year, you get on a uh, full benefits uh, and a 5% pension. And then after you've been here for two years, we like to say you start working for yourself. So then what we have is employee profit sharing, 10% of the, what the company makes, we give back to the employees but you don't actually get that money till about your third year here because that's the way it works. And then after five years, we switch it to 10% pension. So those are some of the, if you make 30 bucks an hour, you get $3 an hour towards your pension. There's no vesting period, it's your money. If you quit, you already it's already your money, it's in your account. So that's a good way to, I think, retain employees. And that's what you need to retire these days. You know, you don't wanna, we don't, I mean, I don't want to punish people to work for us. We want to, we want them to to thrive and survive. And, and if, you know, you work for a company for, you know, 30 years and you haven't got enough money to retire at the end of it, well, you can say, well, you didn't save enough. And well, we noticed uh, about 15 years ago, we had a pension plan that worked like if you put in 3%, we'd match up to 3%. And when we looked at the numbers, you know, the the people that were the higher end wage earners of the company, maybe the accountants or something like that, or, you know, some of the, the bosses and stuff, they were all doing it. But if you went down to the laborers or the, you know, it's people that they just said that they couldn't afford to put 3% in. And I said, well, you know, if you put 3% in, we're going to match. It's a, like, you can't get any better investment than that. But they just found that they weren't able to save the money to get the free 3%. So 
we changed it uh, at that point in time to 5% pension and uh, just where you didn't have to match at all. And I think that was a, a good thing for the staff that sometime they will be able to retire and have enough money in their account to do so. That sounds incredible. Um, if my employees are listening, we're having a pizza party on Friday. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's unbelievable. I mean, yeah, so somebody that's a small or, or medium sized company, sometimes I feel like, you know, like what we're trying to do right now is, you know, RSP matching, you know, because like we're not big enough where I can afford to, to, we can't set up a pension and do all that stuff now. So I think that that all comes with size, but like the fact that you're thinking about that and doing that for your employees is really important. And the fact that you're sitting here saying like, Hey, like after 30 years, if, you know, a person that worked for me for 30 years, you know, can't afford to retire, then like, I've done something wrong, you know? And it's, I think it's important to touch on that, you know, that the men and women, you like, you actually care, you know, which is refreshing to hear. 100%. I kind of wanted to touch on this before we wrap things up. Um, is there a project that really stands out to you when I, when I say that and it's like, whether it be good or bad that you're like, oh, fuck, this is a great story. <laughs> Well, you know, I remember in 1990 when we started a forest, a subdivision called Forest Creek, like I was telling you earlier, we're, we learned how not to do things, right? So that one really stands out a lot. And, you know, for anybody that's going into land development, you know, you get a real learning experience your first time doing it. Yeah. It ends up being a lot more expensive than you thought it was going to be. So by the time you get to your second one, and our second uh, big land development project was Granite Ridge, and it went very well. But the first one didn't go so well. It was also bad timing. You know, we, it was 1990, and there was a bit of a recession. So they, it hit us hard. But, you know, we learned, like I said earlier, we learned what not to do. We learned how not to buy it, you know, with heavy interest rates. We learned how not to sell it. You know, we sold it to people with interest-free and, you know, just lots of, lots of silly mistakes. And... Learned how not to develop it. You know, you develop a whole subdivision and you register the whole thing. And now you go to say the lots aren't selling. Now your taxes are up on those lots. So though that was, and it was a real learning curve on that one. And, well, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, we have lots of irons in the fire for future subdivisions. So the one that I'm most excited about is the one I haven't done yet. So I have a, I have a, some, some big projects in mind right now. And we're hoping that uh, they go well. And, you know, you're talking about going into a global recession right now. And so it kind of makes you, makes us all worry a little bit, but Kavanaugh Construction is not participating in the recession. So. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty <laughs> savage thing to say I like that. Um, yeah, that, that was one of the next thing I wanted to talk to you about um, was just the, you know, the state of the, the economy and, and kind of like, where do you, you see it headed? And I guess, you know, protecting, you don't, you don't have to give away all your details, but like, what does a construction company, I guess, you know, that's in the industry right now do to protect themselves from, I just feel like there's uncertainty, you know, like there's still a ton of work out there, like a shit ton of work out there, but there's uncertainty, which is always like that overwhelming. Like I know for me, at least like I've been in the hospital twice in the past year with AFib relation just because I sit in my bed at night sometimes just grinding my gears, right? Just like what the is going to happen here, you know? Um, and maybe that, that's just my own thing, but what does someone do? Like looking at the account, like what do you think? Like, do you, do you fold up and like, okay, let's play it safe. Do you go balls to the wall? What, what What's kind of your thinking? Well, every situation is obviously a little bit different, but, uh, you know, don't worry about things that are out of your control. You know, you can control yourself and what you're, uh, you're able to do with your staff or your, your company. And, you know, we try and obviously, you know, line up as much work for a year out or six months out or however, however far you can, people will wait or, you know, or sometimes it just takes that long to get the permits for a lot of these jobs. But, you know, there's no, uh, there's, I don't know if there's a right answer, but, you know, obviously you want to, you know, if we're going into inflationary times, money in the bank's not good because it'll be, it'll buy you less tomorrow. However, if we're going into recession, you may be able to buy something for half price tomorrow. So it's, they're talking about, you know, about people are talking about both sides of their mouth, right? Inflation, recession. And I mean, 
obviously you want to, uh, I know the saying is keep your powder dry. You want to keep some money for, uh, for a rainy day. You want to be able to make sure you can make your payments. But on the other hand, line up as much work as you can for the future, you know, and, and not just, uh, you know, not just residential work. I would say that, you know, we are very geared towards residential. And if there's a residential slowdown in house buying, you need to be, make sure that you're prepared to be able to go be proactive rather than reactive and line up some infrastructure work or something along those lines that will keep you busy if houses aren't moving. So uh, that's what I would do. Yeah. Well, that's what you would do. That's what I'm going to do. So as far as, uh, you know, what to do in recessionary times or inflationary times, I'm not sure that, uh, anybody knows the exact answer. I wouldn't be probably here on this podcast with you, but, uh, you know, you got to tr- provide good value when we provide a Jay Stevens say a basement excavation for somebody, you know, we're providing good value in what we do. Yes, Thomas Cavanaugh Construction is going to make a little money on it. We wouldn't be able to survive if we didn't. But we are going to provide great value because we're efficient in how we do it. And it doesn't just end on the on the excavation. You know, when we're building you a house, when you move into that house, there's good value in that product. When we develop a lot, you know, we do it efficiently so that when we are able to sell that lot, and it's good value for the consumer. So if you can provide good value for what they're buying, they'll come back and buy some more. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to touch on. What's, you know, just to, to capitalize it and kind of summarize, what's next for Kavanaugh? What's next for you? Um, you know, keeping the family tradition alive, um, growing the team, scaling back. What is it? Well, the next we're not scaling we, back. Yeah, no, we're not scaling back. That's for sure. We uh, next in line for us is you know more of the same. You know, we just uh, a little bit, you know, a little, not one more shovel, one more dump truck as required. You know, as the as the need for them. You take a look at oh, we have we have this many backhoes rented every day of the week, or this many shovels rented. So maybe it's worthwhile buying one more shovel or along those lines. Um, but for big ventures, you know, we're looking more along the lines of, uh, growing our housing department right now. You know, we have a, uh, a land developer that has been selling lots off to the builders for years, and we've going to make a change in that where we're going to develop the lots and, uh, I guess we'll say eat them internally with, uh, building the houses ourselves on them. So that's kind of the biggest uh, change of uh, of recent. So we're going to be more into the housing than we ever have been before. You're doing everything. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know what, let's create a company that also builds and sells the homes as well. Right. And, was, and that's under the Kavanaugh umbrella. Well, we'll keep it under the patent umbrella as well. Yeah. I, honestly, I could spend three hours asking about everything about what you have going on. And I know that you're busy and you have stuff going on. I feel like we provided a, crap ton of value for people here today and i i asked you the questions that i at least think that a lot of people would would listen to unless there was something extra that that you wanted to add as well but honestly i mean like i said i could spend three hours with you and hopefully when the new podcast studio is done um, we can sit down have a scotch and a cigar if you're a cigar guy or a scotch guy i know i am and just sit sit there and chat and and talk about construction in the industry and have rock talk like like you suggested um but yeah i appreciate you coming on today and uh, thank you for, for coming on. And hopefully we see you at Con Expo 2023. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Thanks. If you need to meet them, they're here at the Con Expo Con Ag. You'll meet industry leaders and friends. You'll build new relationships in the community. You'll find the equipment, services, and people within the construction field. Registration is now open. Save 20% off show admission with the promo code podcast 20 again that is promo code podcast 20 to save 20 percent off your registration i'm going jeff cavanaugh will be going tons of people will be going it is north america's largest construction trade show and it is march 14th to the 18th 2023 in the beautiful las vegas nevada check out con expo con to register and for more info